Um, if it's your first time here, uh, you're, you're a little late, but nonetheless, we're going to sort of recap a few things. Um, as always, I kind of have some preliminary stuff that I want to mention to kind of get us back up to speed. This is a very interesting, very exciting chapter, chapter eight. Um, I got a lot, a lot to say about this chapter. Um, and so I don't want to, I'm going to try not to digress too far into ground that we've already covered, but I really think for tonight to have its full oomph to really come across, we do need to cover a few things. And so again, if this is your first time here, uh, I'm MC Owens and I'm doing this series of coordinated classes with uh, Michael Taft. On Sunday nights, I'm breaking down the Vimalakirti Sutra. And then on uh, Thursday nights, 7.30, he's doing meditations based on the sutra, uh, based on the chapters as we go along. Um, and so I might actually reference some of the meditations that he's been doing. Um, but actually, although this Vimalakirti experience started uh, last month, uh, this has been going on all of April and it'll go on all of May, um, as, a, as a master of ceremonies here, as a true MC Owens, uh, I've actually been sort of preparing us, if you've been coming to these classes, I've actually been preparing us for a while, in many ways all year, folks, uh, getting us ready to understand and digest this particular sutra. And what I mean by that is that many months ago, like back in like January or something, February, uh, I did a series on the four foundations of mindfulness. Very essential Buddhist sutra on the four foundations of mindfulness, a very important practice. And so one of the ways that you could imagine this is that then sort of at the beginning of the year, we started sort of laying down that uh, one, two, three, four, the four foundations of mindfulness as a driving beat for this whole experience that we're uh, that we're undergoing. After that, uh, I did a series on the four formless realms for uh, infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, and neither perception or non-perception. Also an essential four, uh, four by four beat that's going on in the backdrop of this. Then we moved into some interesting territory, which was I started talking about sutras, Buddhist sutras that use similes, parables, and metaphors. And so then we started to sprinkle in a little bit of foam, right? We started th threw some bubbles into the action and we started to get a little funky because we were using this sort of poetry. And in particular, I wanna draw, uh, remind everybody that we covered in one night, we covered something called the Fena Sutta, P-H-E-N-N-A, the Flowers Sutra. And it's in this very famous, very old uh, Buddhist sutta, Buddhist text, that the Buddha gives the analogy of the lotus flower, which starts its life in the mud, uh, the muck and the mire of the pond, but transcends that and blossoms into a beautiful flower, unsoiled, unsullied, as it were, by the mud and the muck and the mire of the pond. And it's, that's a very old sutra in which the Buddha introduces this idea of sort of transcendence, transcending the world, in many ways, something that we've been talking about night after night after night. And so after sprinkling in those flowers and the foam and the bubbles and all of those sort of metaphors, that's when we got to this Vimalakirti experience, which is in a way truly a, a wedding and a melding of those practices, by which I mean, these really, you know, old, very uh, established meditative practices, calming, deep, deep, deep calming, um, dhyana, samadhi, all of that. Deep, deep practice. That's, that is the practice. But then again, I kind of married it or was uh, welding it with these similes and these parables and these metaphors from all these other sutras. And so that's what we're gonna get back into tonight. And so I just kind of wanted to remind everybody of this, this sort of beat that's going on, the four foundations of mindfulness beat with the little ch -ch 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 of that foam and those bubbles right on top. And that's where we're, we're dropping the needle right in this Vimalakirti experience, right? So 
this is an old sutra, right? Uh, we, I went through the history of it and all that before, and it is surprisingly not about the Buddhas. It's actually about this guy, Vimalakirti, right? This very famous, what his name means is a, a kind of flawless fame. Right? His, his fame is perfect, right? He's very famous. Uh, we've been hearing about this guy, you know, for weeks now. And one of the things I'm going to do tonight, and unfortunately, of course, he's sick. Right, he's ill, and so that's sort of the premise of this uh, sutra is that Vimalakirti has, has grown ill. And I want to going to take us back just to kind of bring us again, sort of back up to speed about what's going on here. I'm going to take us quickly back to chapter two. So this is after the miraculous, uh, the miracle in chapter one, where the Buddha transforms all these little umbrellas, all these little parasols, into one giant parasol. But that's kind of like a, this opener, this is an opening chapter. So, but in chapter two, we meet the star of the show of Malakirti. And if you happen to have the Robert Thurman uh, translation, which I've been mainly sticking to and reading from, I'm on page 22 in chapter two. And this is where, he, you know, Vimalakirti, he's, he's, he's ill, he's sick. And so all the townspeople of Vishali, that's where he's from, all these Lichavis, all these people from Vaishali, they come over to see like how he's doing. And, you know, ironically, like rather than consoling Vimalakirti, he winds up, he's sick, but he winds up giving them a Dharma talk, consoling them. And so really quickly, I just want to remind us of that. Uh, this is again on page 22 and Vimalakirti, he says to everybody, he says, friends, this, this body is so impermanent, fragile, unworthy of your confidence. And it's so feeble. It's so insubstantial, perishable, short-lived, painful, filled with diseases and subject to change. Thus, my friends, as this body is only a vessel of many illnesses, the wise do not rely on it, right? So this is a, a theme that we've been talking about, this idea of not clinging to, uh, not identifying with, not being attached to the physical body, which is constantly changing, subject to disease, subject to decay and dying, right? But this is, this is the message. This is the gospel of Buddhism. This is the good news of Buddhism, right? To that there's a, a, a mode of being that is not attached to this dying body. So there's nothing really, I want to say, new, you know, in this Mahayana Sutra in terms of what the Malakirti tells the people. But then right at the end of his discourse, now I'm kind of jumping towards sort of towards the bottom of page 22 there. He says, therefore, friends, you should, you should move away, uh, sort of be disinterested in such a body as that. You should despair of it. And you should arouse your admiration for the body of the Buddhas, for the body of the Tathagatas. And he says, friends, the body of a Tathagata is the body of the Dharma. And then he goes on. And for anybody who wasn't here, of course, I encourage you to go back and read chapter two. But even after tonight, I'm going to encourage everybody to go back and read chapter chapter two because you're gonna be like wait he said all that michael michael read this whole this, the whole chapter i don't really remember him saying all of that so i will encourage you to go back to that but i really i just wanted to touch on this interesting idea of of don't don't cling to don't be attached to this body rather arouse your admiration for the body of the tathagata oh so this is what's new. This is what's Mahayana about it, right? This is what's going to be of interest for us tonight is this sort of what will be called the Dharmakaya, the Dharma body of the Buddha. It's going to, at first, this is all sounds a little weird. And in fact, if you were kind of an old school type of Buddhist, maybe you were a Theravadan monk or renunciant or something, if you were in the audience at Vimalakirti's house, you would have been like, yeah, this body, yeah, this body's, yeah. And then you would have been like, this body, the Tathagata. <laughs> what? Wait a minute, what is all that about? 
So if you were reading it and you're an old school Buddhist and you were like, body of the Tathagata, what's Vimalakirti talking about? Well, tonight's the night that we find out what Vimalakirti was talking about. So that quickly, that's chapter two. Of course, chapter three and four are funny because we're introduced to this, uh, this band of misfits, this band of these Shravaka disciples representing this old style of Buddhism, the really monastic, renunciatory, shave your head, wear robes, beg for your food, no sex, no home, that type of thing. Those are the renunciants. And the Buddha sort of suggests that they should all go check on Vimalakirti, to which again, they all politely decline. Then we move our attention to these adept bodhisattvas, these really enlightened beings. This is in chapter four, and they all decline to go see the guy because he's so smart. And then we're introduced to Manjushri, the crown prince of the Dharma. And in a way, as far as the, um, well, like best supporting actor, let's put it that way, as far as the way the sutra goes down, it's kind of this back and forth discourse between Vimalakirti and Manjushri as soon as everybody shows up to Vimalakirti's house. But this was where it got very interesting because before everybody shows up, Vimalakirti does this miracle. He does this magic trick in which he makes his house empty, right? He makes all the furniture disappear. He makes all the curtains disappear, the chandeliers. Actually, even his, his wife, his kids, his servants, his everybody. He makes everything disappear. And of course, I've been talking the last few nights, the last few Sundays about how that's a very, very interesting idea there. And yes, it's funny and humorous and, and Shariputra, this, this guy Shariputra is like, where are we supposed to sit? But of course, the, the, the interpretation of that that I've been giving everybody is that, is that this, these Shravakas, they're used to meditating somewhere, maybe in a forest, monastery, or vihara. But more importantly, they're used to putting their mind on certain things, certain places, certain ideas. And this idea, this Buddhist idea, Mahayana idea of emptiness, that is the sort of the focus of the sutra. We're going to talk a lot about it tonight. Well, that is sort of played out in the sutra by this act of Melchizedek making everything in his house disappear. And then these monks start to wonder, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Where am I supposed to sit? How am I supposed to conceive of nothingness and not even nothingness? I, I actually, these guys are like, I'm, I used to be in the business of, of meditating on nothingness, but emptiness is something else entirely. And so in order to really uh, understand the next few chapters and the progression, last week I introduced the Vajra Sutra. This is a other sutra. This is a whole other sutra. Very famous Mahayana Sutra, maybe the most famous Mahayana Sutra. And I introduced it because there's kind of a, um, there's kind of a cipher, like kind of a code that's embedded in, well, a lot of sutras, but there's a code embedded in the Vimalakirti Sutra that is, well, it's sort of imagines or assumes that you know all about the Vajra Sutra. The, the Vajra Sutra is also known as the Diamond Sutra. And most people know it as the Diamond Sutra. So I might use that name instead of Vajra Sutra, Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra. Interesting sutra, that one. It's, it's pretty old. A lot of people think it's actually a cusp sutra in between so-called Theravada and Mahayana. There's no bodhisattvas. There's no flowers. There's no wild craziness. It's actually just a dialogue between a monk who I've drawn here um, named Subhuti. And Subhuti, this is the sutra. I'm gonna about to just drop the Vajra Sutra on you again. Subhuti goes to the Buddha and he says, hey Buddha, suppose good men and good women for that matter are interested in developing Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment what should they do? <laughs> what then? Right? So, A, the reason why I wanted to reintroduce the Vajra Sutra and the message of that sutra is because this idea of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment, you might have, that might ring uh, familiar to you. 
you know, in every chapter we have read, they have spoken about this idea of conceiving the spirit for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment or developing the mind of supreme unsurpassable enlightenment, what's called anuttara samyak sambodhi. And this is one of those things that's unfortunate when you read sutras across, um, across translators, like we're reading Robert Thurman, but we could have been reading uh, Burton Watson's translation from the Chinese. And then, you know, we could be referencing a bunch of other diamond sutras or Vajra sutras and a bunch of other sutras. And what's lost in English is that this idea of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. Well, I don't want to fall into a, a fallacy here. <laughs> so, warning. But this is kind of like an, an attainment, an accomplishment. Nothing is attained, of course. But the idea is, is that it's... Um, it is, it's like Buddhahood. It's, it's, a, it's a particular exalted state of enlightenment that all of these Mahayana sutras are actually interested in. Um, they're interested in you conceiving in, in the spirit of developing that supreme unsurpassable enlightenment and then very interested in you realizing that supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. And what I want, what my point is though, is that, that this language of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, it's not really like, well, hey Buddha, what if you want to be really smart? It's not just like a gloss for like really smart, really enlightened, super duper enlightened. It's actually sort of a, in Buddhism, a, uh, an, a, an indicator or a, a, a name for a state of being in a way, a particular state of being that we'll, we'll try to get to tonight even. But the idea is, is that I want you to know that all these sutras are discussing this idea and it's in the Vajra Sutra, in the Diamond Sutra, that the world actually hears about this for the first time. And what I mean by that is that the sutra is Shibuti saying, hey Buddha, some of us have wondered, what if we're not, what if we're, we're, we're our hearts, our, you know, de our desires good, we're, we're good on suffering, craving and all of that. But like, what if we were like going for Buddhahood? What if we were going for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi? And the Buddha says, Oh, oh, well, if we're going for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, then I'll tell you what. Of all kinds of living beings, whether they're born from eggs, like chickens, right? Whether they're born from moisture, uh, or whether they're born from a womb, like mammals, or even if they're born by magical transformation, like gods. All beings from the lowest hell realm to the highest heaven, even if I caused every single kind of possible sentient being to enter into liberation, guess what, Shibuti? In reality, not a single sentient being would ever, ever enter enlightenment. And Shibuti's like, huh? Like, how could that be? And the Buddha says, well, any bodhisattva that's in the business of being a bodhisattva should not cling to or be attached to four lakshana, the appearance of four appearances, four qualities, four characteristics that things do or do not have a soul or an atman, an essential self, that things do or do not have an individuality or a personality, that things do or do not have sattva, beingness, sentient beingness, sentient organs, sentientness, uh, anim animation, or jiva, life, <laughs> or lifespan. And now these are like, these are pretty heavy because your, your average shravaka, your average Buddhist meditator monk is in is interested in these lakshana, these characters, characteristics or qualities of things. Color, shape, size, number, like all of these sort of like what makes something what it is, right? And the meditator is sort of the old school Shravaka meditator even was very good at sort of releasing their mind of thinking that these qualities were owned or possessed by the thing that was being observed. 
But these four qualities are very heavy because these get into distinguishing things as like, oh, living beings worth saving and teaching and then non-living beings that would not understand what I was saying to begin with. So there's no use teaching the Dharma to them, right? This is saying that distinguishing even animate from inanimate, living from non-living, all of that is, are also distinctions upon distinctions upon distinctions. And so, what's, and so the, the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, actually very slowly tries to unpack those four lakshana or characteristics or qualities. But I mentioned a moment ago that, that the, the Vimalakirti Sutra is sort of in dialogue with the Vajra Sutra. And what I mean by that is, is that when the crown prince of the Dharma, Manju Sri, when he first shows up to Vimalakirti's house in chapter five, they discuss Atmans, selves, souls, the nature of the self or the soul. And in classic Buddhist fashion, using ideas like the five skandhas and constituent elements or aggr and aggregation, conditioning, ideas like that, Manjushri and Vimalakirti sort of di dissect or sort of deconstruct the idea of a self. Then you jump forward to uh, chapter six and they start talking about notions of individuality that I consider myself to be this and not, and not that over there and not up there, this sense of individuality, separatedness from everything else in the world, right? And that's called a Pudgala. There was actually a whole sect of Buddhists that were called the Pudgala Vadins because they were actually kind of into this idea of a personality, kind of like a provisional self, like it, that somehow the aggregations and the, and the conditioning of Samskara sort of produce a kind of personality, sort of. But most Buddhists and Mahayana Buddhists are not into the idea of any kind of provision, even provisional self. So this is saying no Pudgala. And then, of course, uh, last time we, the, when I introduced this, we talked about this idea of a sattva or of a very idea of a being. And this is where we reintroduced this Vajra Sutra, Diamond Sutra language of, of all the types of sentient beings, whether they're born from an egg, moisture, a womb, or even from magical transformation, of all the kinds of beings, of all the ways to come into this world through a womb, out of an egg, in, in a, on the surface of a pond, right, through moisture, or through magical transformation. That's what was being dealt with in the last one was all the different types of beings, men, women, yada, 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 hell dweller, like all the different types of beings. And I think what I'm actually going to do now, so that's, you just need to know all of that. That in a way should be refresher because a lot of it I, I mentioned last week. But I'm going to just pause for a minute, a but it's, it's going to be a fun minute. It might be the funnest minute of all the whole night. All right. So I'm going to pause for a minute because we're going to, we got to get inconceivable. Right. I mentioned this before because, you know, we're doing this on these like staggered nights. And so we get a thing going and then a week goes by or a few days go by and we don't think about these things or whatever. And so the beauty of the sutra, of course, is that this baby's been rolling along, right? When we first got to Vimalakirti's house, there wasn't a thing. We didn't have anywhere to sit. But then luckily, all of these magical thrones came from another universe. And so we, now we had a place to sit, right? But then when the goddess showed up, all these flowers started falling everywhere, you know? And so now the house started to get you know, pretty crowded, right? And so this thing keeps moving along and kind of building on top of itself and building on top of itself. And if we have forgotten about moving through the Dharma door or the gateway of the inconceivable, if we forgot that we did that, then where would we be, right? Well, so I'm going to take a moment to actually tie, tie a bunch of stuff together. It's going to be wild. <laughs> so, but the idea here is, is like, this is about that inconceivable liberation that came up in chapter six. And in particular, 
the focus of that meditation and it was beautifully rendered in Michael Taft's meditation on the on the following Thursday the 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 crux of the inconceivable liberation is the ability to put the king of mountains the the giant mountain in the middle of our world universe mount meru the ability to put it into a mustard seed without shrinking mount meru or growing the mustard seed right so we're going to have to spend a moment doing that in order to get to this beautiful chapter eight all right so the way i'm going to do that is i'm going to piggyback off of a, an example that uh, michael taft gave at the end of his last meditation last thursday if you weren't there don't worry again i'm going to recap it somebody asked about this sort of uh this idea of emptiness the empty nature of all things again that's what we're talking about it's what we're kind of trying to point to all night. And Michael Taft used a, a great example. Yeah, I've used the uh, example myself in the past. And it's the example of a dictionary. And it's the example of how, you know, a word in, in the dictionary is defined by a bunch of other words. That if you didn't know what those words meant, you'd have to go looking in the dictionary to find the definition of those words. And there starts to be this funny thing that happens if you look at a dictionary that way, in that there's no like one word that's the word that all the other words are sort of relative. They're all, all actually kind of relative to, to each other in that way. You just start going chasing forever. And it's like, let's say you want to look up a lion, right? Lion, you know, uh, you know, a jungle dwelling mammal. Well, I don't know what a jungle is. I don't know what a mammal is, right? Go, to, go look under the mammals, but on the mammals. Oh, okay, got it. Da, da, da. And you, you eventually wind up that a, finding out that a, a lion is a lion or a tiger is a tiger, right? This, that they're defined by themselves in this way. Because if you want to know what a mammal is, see, see tiger kind of a thing. They just start referencing and pointing to each other. So I'm really glad that he brought up that example because I'm going to go a little further with that. And so wild stuff's going to go on tonight because we're going to be talking about language and the nature of language in language using language so uh, so hold on I, i'm let me let me pause any questions before i die because i'm about to like write stuff on the board and it's gonna get crazy so okay because that, that was kind of all review but if there's questions everybody's look, looking good all right. So I'm going to, you know, I'm digressing even further. So now it's like, you know, Vajra Sutra, now we're digressing even further. And I'm going to introduce, this is going to be a fun little like magic trick kind of game. And well, we're going to see how it goes. So I'm going to draw, I left a little space here. I know I got a lot going on the board that I haven't even mentioned yet. So do try to kind of ignore for the moment all of this. And, and just deal with, deal with me here. Yeah. So we're gonna draw a, we're gonna draw a symbol on the board, right? And of course, I'm gonna, I, I don't, I'm not gonna have the joy and the pleasure of, of the call and response and the back and forth with you all tonight about what is that? What do you think that is? And da da da, right? So I'm just, going to dive into this idea of like on the board i have what to um well you know to the mind in the realm of desire the comma dot to the mind in that realm you might be seeing the letter a right it sure has the form of the letter a the shape of a letter a right and so the way that i'm gonna like try to move us through tonight and tie a bunch of these ideas together is through this this symbol and again just follow me on this just sort of um what what we're dealing with here is is like actually so what michael tasked the uh, dictionary analogy that's a great one for dependent origination this sort of back and forthness of all things right we're gonna go a little further with this though 
And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, dualism, let's, you know, a lot of people have been asking about dualism. And we, and I've used the term, we've mentioned it a few times. And I kind of often hesitate with, with, with this stuff and Buddhism and Dharma. And, and I kind of say, yeah, it's non-dual, but it's kind of like crazier than that. It's like kind of even wired, wilder than non-dual. And what I mean by that is, is that duality here, of course, would be like the letter, the letter A, and then what is not the letter A? The bl like literally the black and the white here of the board in that sense, right? So the form, the rupa, is the letter A, right? But the play of light and shadow, the play of lightness and darkness, of course, is that this, for you to even cognize that I've written something on the board, you need the white and the black to sort of play off of each other. That's dependent origination. And again, that's very dualistic in that way. But we're going to go for something even a little more subtle than that. And what that is, is, is that, uh, and again, I'm just going to have to just jump into it. I'm going to suggest that, that even though I have written in a formal, positive, positing sense, I've written the letter A on the board, there's also the kind of a way that I have sort of, like, secretly in a very kind of mysterious way right i've sort of written all the other and i don't mean what i'm doing now i mean with my letter a right that the o and p and q and r and s and t and u and v and w and x and y and z right that there's a way that when i posit a letter the letter a Yes, you see the letter A, and you're like, yes, that's the letter A. But there's a way that subtly, in a very kind of yin, like if this is yang, the A, then in a shadow yin way, all other 25 letters of the alphabet sort of, they kind of dance around this one. In fact, they sort of dance around in and through it. And what I mean by that is, is that Yes, I have put the letter A on the board, but there is no way for you to conceive of that as the letter A without having conceived of the letter B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z. Because what the letter A is, is part of a logical framework, a structural framework, a matrix of understanding and meaning. And so whenever you say A, you actually say all the other ones. Or, of course, like a kind of, now let me give you a little metaphor. Like think of it as like a wild 26-sided uh, Rubik's cube, right? And the idea is, is that the next time when I say B, now all of a sudden, click, the little A is there, the B, or sorry, not the B. We posited the B, the C, the D, the E, F. G H I all the way through the rest of them. Because again, the letter B is just part 126th of a logical matrix framework that is in your head <laughs> that you were conditioned to learn in elementary school so that when you saw a shape, it was more than that, the shadow and the light. It was more than just the shape. It was one of 26 letters. And I often make the joke, you know, that it's not like that in the first grade, they taught you the letter A, and then they're like, and then you can't wait till second grade, then we'll teach you about all about the letter B. And then when you get to college, you'll find all about it. No, it's, it's actually you learn them all at once because you must learn them all at once. Again, they are a matrix, a matrika, a logical framework that's like a Rubik's cube that whatever is at the forefront of your mind, the rest shifts to the back, is in the back of your mind always, right? Everybody follow me on this example. Everybody good on this, right? Very, very subtle, right? Because we're not talking about dualism like A and B. We're actually talking about, about how that one letter secretly contains all the rest of the letters. 
oh, but what's really, really interesting about this whole language letter game is that when I write the letter A, well, there's also a way in which the English language and even the letters that we use are predicated on the Greeks. And so there's a way that like alpha and beta and delta and all, because delta is the letter D just in the Greek version. And so all these other letters from these other languages are in the letter A. And how is that? Because the very idea of a letter is predicated on all those other letters. They're all sort of secretly in there too. And not only that, not only are all the letters in every single letter, all of the possible combinations of those letters, i.e. words, are also in every single letter. And not only that, not only are all the other letters in every letter and all the combinations of all the other letters, i.e. words, in all those other letters, but all the combinations of words, i.e. sentences, are in every single letter. And it goes on and on and on like that. Oh, what, what's interesting about this, of course, is that there's an English word that we use a lot, but it has lost a little bit of its meaning. And it's this English word logo, like a corporate logo. But that idea of a logo, of a corporate logo, comes from this Greek word logos. And I, yeah, I didn't introduce the alpha, beta, and the Greek alphabet for nothing. The idea of a logos is like heavy, really, really deep. But what it, the idea of a logo, and logos means word, by the way, and if you're into the Bible or whatever, this is the, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning was the logos. So there's some uh, interesting ideas if, you're, if you already know about that. There's an interesting crossover. But what's going on with this idea of a logo is all of the meaning being compressed into a symbol, Right? That's what's happening here with this idea of all the other letters being somehow kind of hidden inside the one letter. In Buddhism, this is actually what they'll, they refer to as the interpenetration of all dharmas. That it's not just that dharma A is dependent on dharma B to make dharma C, and therefore all the dharmas are in, in, in interdependent, codependently arising. That's one thing, and that's wild enough as it is, bodhisattvas, right, for dependent origination. But this is actually saying that all dharmas interpenetrate, and that any single one dharma, like one letter, contains the conceptualization of all letters, and again, all the words, all the sentences, and all of that. Everybody, to go, everybody ready to go one step further? So does that mean that um, every dharma has... It has all the other dharmas, like the A has all the other letters. That's what I'm getting at. Because what I wanted to introduce you to was a kind of a wild idea. And I'm just going to kind of re really be able to drop this on you and then walk away. Because I do have other places to go. But the idea of this is that if you understood what was just said about a letter containing all the other letters, because it must... Like, again, you can't, I, I also often make the joke too that I can't just like, when nobody's looking, come and take the letter W away. I can't just like sneak it out of the alphabet and nobody will notice, right? Again, it's part of this framework. So if you got that idea that the one contains the all and they must because it's how I understand it, then all of a sudden, this becomes a letter in the book of the world that you read and what i mean by that is is like i got all these i got a library behind me i literally have a library which is a collection of books oh look what's a book oh a bunch of words what are all the words i just told you they're all of them right and so there's a way that to understand what a library is it it's off of the book, which contains all the words, which contains all the letters. But what is library? <gasps> a word. And so it just starts going around and around until you realize that it's a giant conceptual <laughs> matrix framework. <laughs> it's a giant conceptual framework, uh, matrix world, everybody. Um, 
Okay. Everybody good with that? Because we're, we're going to go even further. So what we're talking about tonight, and let me make sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 I, I, I almost missed it, right? So if, if you understood what I was saying about all the letters being in the one letter, then the idea is, and I'm just gonna have to fast forward, I can't, I can't at, hold your hand and walk you all the way there, but the idea is, you could put in your hand a tiny little mustard seed and understand it as a letter in the conceptual framework of the world that you live in that includes Mount Maru and all the other mountains. And so they're already kind of in there, aren't they? Sort of. And you know what? You didn't have to shrink Mount Maru and you didn't have to grow. In fact, the mustard seed is nice the size it is that way, right? And so there it is, folks. You, you, you can do it. It's right there. That's how you put Mount Maru in a mustard seed. And it's not, a, it's not a, uh, it's right there. That is the inconceivable or at least that's sort of a, another gateway to the inconceivable in terms of understanding sort of the, ins, you know, the way Michael Taft did it and the way I sort of did it the night we did the inconceivable was more about inside outside type of stuff, ideas of like where you begin, where you end. And all of a sudden, if you're not so clingy and attached to notions of where you begin and end, now you can grow your body and sit on those giant thrones that Manjushri worked up for us, right? Well, this is, again, this is a little different because it's, it's um, well, again, you don't have to grow or shrink anything in that way. And that's why that's what gets in it. interesting. Questions or answer ideas? So tonight, interesting that, we're, that I'm using the mustard seed. Interesting that we're using the seed analogy, right? Because tonight, what we're gonna be talking about are seeds. They're called bijas, B-I-J-A in Sanskrit, bijas, sometimes actually V-I-J-A as well, but usually B-I-J-A, bija, a seed. That's what we're talking about tonight. And I will actually use this. We're going to start talking about chapter eight now, folks. That's going to get us up to speed. I'm going to uh, di digress for another minute to talk about this title. This is a, the title of this chapter, as Robert Thurman translates it, is The Family of the Tathagatas. Tathagata is sort of another word for Buddha. It's actually kind of not. It's, it's a little different than that. But it's kind of about like the Buddha family, family of the Buddhas. At least that's what that translation is. But this this chapter is really heavy and it ties in a lot with well the vajra sutra stuff that i went over um and all of that but there's really quickly and just because i'm going to go through this a little in order i want you to know that in in the chinese versions the title of this chapter is actually regarding Manjushri's first question. Man, so this is how the, the chapter starts, by the way. And I'm not going to read too much. I'm going to read the poem. There's a poem at the end of the chapter that I want to read or I actually want to recite. Um, so I'm going to just kind of go through this really quickly. But this chapter starts with then the crown prince of the Dharma. Manjushri said to the Licha Vivimalakirti, noble sir. How does the Bodhisattva follow the way to attain the qualities of the Buddha? All right. And what happens in Chinese is that that idea of, of following the way to uh, achieve the qualities of the Buddha. Well, you have to understand that this was this sutra became very popular in in China uh, very quickly, actually, uh, in like year 200 year 300 of ad this thing was translated and they flipped for it and when this was translated in the year 200 or so the original chinese translator decided to focus on that first question of manjushri and they translated this chapter as the the way of the buddha the buddha dao 
if you're familiar, familiar with Taoism and this idea of Taoism, the way, this is like kind of Taoism is arguably like this indigenous religious philosophical tradition of China. It's focused on this concept of the, the, the way of nature or the, the way a, a natural flow or a natural course to things, right? This kind of flow to things, that's the Tao, but it also means a path or a road, right? It's a double, like a double entendre where it means both a, a way to do something and the way to get there. So in the way that this uh, first sentence and then it became the title of the chapter, it was the Buddha, the, the Buddha's Tao, the Buddha's way. And what I, the only reason I'm pausing on this for a moment is because it's little things like this that probably made this sutra very popular in China when it was first translated because they were like, ooh, the, the Tao, the Tao of the Buddha, what's that? Like that, that's very exciting, okay? And indeed, this first uh, uh, exchange with Manjushri is about how to uh, how to become a Buddha, how to walk the Buddhist path, what is the Buddhist Tao or the Buddhist way. Interestingly, now, of course, uh, the, the answer that Vimalakirti gives is, oh, what's the, the Buddha's way? It's the wrong way. <laughs> and she's like, the, I mean, the wrong way. It's like, yeah. And it turns into this funny paradoxical thing about, well, about that it's the wrong way. Um, and it's, it's too delicate. I would either have to spend all night just on that, dissecting it carefully to show you how it's working, or I'm going to try to get back to it by the end of the night. Okay, so that's just, just hold on. I just want you to know that that's sort of one part of the sutra is about this Buddhist path of the Buddha way. And it is in this discourse that wouldn't you, wouldn't you know it? Uh, Manju Shri, he says, noble sir, flowers like the blue lotus, the red lotus, the white lotus, and the water lily, lily, the moon lily, they do not grow on the dry ground or in the wilderness, but they do grow in the swamps and mud banks. Just so, the qualities of a Buddha do not grow in living beings, certainly destined for the uncreated, which is code for shravakas that just stay in the uncreated, that just stay in the void, that just stay in the no thingness, right? Buddha qualities do not grow in living beings, certainly destined for the uncreated, but do grow in those living beings who are like swamps and mud banks of passions. Likewise, seeds do not grow in the sky, but do grow in the earth. All right, I'm going to pause there. That little part is the, is the essence and the heart of that initial exchange with Manjushri and Vimalakirti. This idea of like, what's the Buddha's way? Oh, it's the wrong way. It's the passions. It's defilement. <laughs> And it's this idea, and we're starting, I'm, going, I'm starting to try to weave this together, folks, but it's all of this beautiful metaphors and, and similes of seeds. And this idea of like, what does he say? Seeds don't grow in the sky. You can't just sprinkle a bunch of seeds in the sky and sp sprout flowers. They need to be plant planted in soil full of, of uh, manure, right? So that's sort of the operating metaphor of that first part. Again, I'm going to get there. All right, I hope to get back to it to quote a few parts. But I'm going to have to just jump to the heart of tonight, of which everything was just preparatory leading up till now, even our reintroduction to the inconceivable. There is a bodhisattva, and interesting, he was not in our first list of bodhisattvas, but he is in the Chinese editions when in the first chapter, when it's like bodhisattva so-and-so was there, bodhisattva so-and-so, bodhisattva so-and-so. In the Chinese edition, he, he, this guy appears. His name is Sarva Rupa Samdarshana. Sarva Rupa Samdarshana. That's this bodhisattva's name. 
Uh, darshan means to view, uh, to look at, right? Sam darshana means to view equally, to view equally as sam, sam darshana. Sarva, sarva means everything. Like there's a great term, sarva jnana, all knowledge, omniscience. Well, this is sarva rupa, all forms, rupa, shape, right? All forms, sarva rupa samdarshana. Uh, usually translated as viewing all rupa, viewing all forms equally. That's this bodhisattva. This bodhisattva is going to lead us into this uh, wonderful um, poem that I want to recite. But first, again, uh, uh, let me just read his question, and then I'll do a little interpretation of it. The bottom of page 66 here. Thereupon, the bodhisattva Sarva Rupa Samdarshana, who was present in that assembly, addressed the Lichavivi Malakirti. Householder, where are your father and mother, your children, your wife, your servants, your maids, your laborers, your attendants? Where are your friends, your relatives, your kinsmen? Where are your servants, your horses, your elephants, your chariots, your bodyguards, your sedan barriers, bearers? That's the question. And really, uh, again, kind of quickly, just, um, yeah, we're doing good on time, but I do just want to cut to the chase, tie this together, right? Um, oh, actually, sorry, I, I'm just realizing all the notation here. So I will, Eric, if you want to ask your question, this is a great time to do it. Um, I'm a novice at manning the show here, so I apologize. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Michael, especially because I wanted to like uh, rescue two of your comments. When you were talking about how Buddhahood emerges from the soil and how those who wish to remain in the void, those Shavakas or Pratyeka Buddhas, uh, I just, uh, well, I have this realization that maybe that's why in the Mahayana of Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti and that long tradition is very well established that Bodhicitta is the conduit to this Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi because it's that wish of returning to the soil, quote unquote, what is going to drive you for enlightenment. So thank you for that. And second, uh, uh, now that you were talking about the Dharmakaya and all this talk with language and letters and words, I don't know if we are going to hear about the Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya here. However, uh, what's interesting to me is uh, this, at least in the Nyingma tradition, the old school of Tibetan Buddhism, is explained how the Buddhas, they exist, quote unquote, in the Dharmakaya, and isn't this Dharmakaya that all the Buddhas are of one taste, that they are just one taste in the Dharmakaya. What's interesting is that their emanation forms of Sambhogakaya, it said that they communicate uh, in symbols. It's called the symbolic lineage of the Vidyadharas. And the, the third lineage, the oral of hearing uh, lineage of the ordinary beings is the one that is transmitted orally through words. Hmm. So we go from absolutely nothing to say about the Dharmakaya to the symbolic uh, Sambhogakaya to the oral tradition of the Nirmanakaya. Mm -hmm. The one that transmits is transmitted by Nirmanakayas. So I just found that interesting. That's an awesome comment, Eric. Thank you so much for, and actually thank you because I probably won't, I probably will hopefully get back to the Dharmakaya, but won't be able to tie it into the idea of the three bodies. Um, so thanks for bringing those up for everybody who, who is familiar with them. Um, any other questions or comments before I unpack this? Cool. So here's the deal. If you go back to my 
interpretation of the Vimalakirti Sutra as a kind of response to the Vajra Sutra, response to the Diamond Sutra. And I mentioned that the conversation in chapter five is all about the Atman, the inconceivable, and the idea of of the of that meditation was all and that chapter was all about the Pugala individuality. Last chapter was dealing with this idea of sattva of beingness and not beingness, but insofar as again, man, woman, God, hell dweller, all the different types of beings. And I want to remind us of that first um, when everybody shows up to Vimalakirti's house and there's, it's empty. They're like, hey, you know, Shai Butcher's like, where are we supposed to sit? Great. But then these other questions of where are we supposed to sit, sit on these thrones. And then what I'm getting at here is that if last, if you remember Manjushri's question last time, this very profound, very, very, very important question to Vimalakirti. Manjushri says, hey, if, if the Bodhisattva views everything as empty, including sattva, including beings and no beings, how do they generate karuna, metta, mudita? How do we generate the great love towards sentient beings if you, if you just told me you wait, the sattva, no, that you just told me there's no such thing as a sentient being. So that was Manjushri's question. How do you develop the great love, right? And, if, and the, the truncated, abridged answer that, that Vimalakirti gives is that to love indiscriminately towards just without distinguishing sentient and insentient, just love, just have compassion. That's Maha Karuna, that's Maha Medha, Maha Mudita, Maha Upeksha. So this Mahayana idea is saying, no, it's not, it's not sort of, but it's potentially dangerous to say there's no such thing as living beings, but if you're in the business of being a Bodhisattva, it's not a problem. It's like, oh, great, woo. So it's sort of that response. So again, Manjushri asks, how do we do this, right? If, if there's no such thing as a sentient being. Sarva Rupa Sandarshana, Bodhisattva. He says, hey, where's your family? That's the question. Hey, in this house of emptiness, what do we do with familiar relations? What do we do with my parents? What do we do with these ideas of lineage? So that's one idea is kind of, well, you know, thinking about this old school Buddhist idea of renouncing family and home, right? So that's sort of underneath that, but it's even kind of deeper than that. Because, and, and again, I'm going to just uh, speed it up a little here. It's not even so much uh, the Bodhisattva's question. It's not even so much about, hey, in this house of emptiness, Where's your family? Where are your friends? Where's all the elephants? Where's every, you know, where it's, it's about that. But then if we do, because this is one chapter. So if we did tie it back to the initial conversation that I was unfortunately kind of had to speed through. If we understand this idea that Buddhahood and enlightenment, it's inconceivable because it's not a thing it's not an object. It has no qualities or characteristics that can be conceived of because characteristics and qualities are totally fabricated things, right? So the whole time the sutra is pointing at or trying to point at this Buddha body, the Dharmakaya, this, this other Buddha body that isn't in history, time and space, Siddhartha, Indian guy, prince, but they're trying to point at this Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, this, I, I often jokingly call it the Lakshana list monster. It's this, that which has no qualities, that which has no characteristics, that which cannot be found in the dictionary. It does not have a name or a label or anything like that. Yeah, that, that. So the idea here is, is that if we're 
thinking in terms of the progression of the sutra working its way from self individuality individuality sentient beingness and now the very idea of life the very idea of a lifespan of being born living and dying so jiva having life the bodhisattva's question what this chapter is asking it's asking like where are buddhas born what kind of womb or egg or moisture or transformation what how are they born what are they born of how do, where where's your family dude who are your parents like what is going on here that is the bodhisattva's question so it's an even deeper level now so not just sort of ideas of male female different types of beings but now we're talking about we're talking about genealogy. We're talking about genealogy, right? The succession of species, the succession of anything and where it comes from. And so it's, so now, oh, so this is where it all ties together really beautifully, right? So the idea here is, is that this idea of, um, uh, and it's, uh, if, you, if you read the, the, read it in Chinese, it's really wild. And it's, and it's something that I wanted to try to articulate. It's very hard um, to do, but it might just happen anyways. You, you kind of, it's, it, it's very subtle. And it actually, it's just the way that it, uh, kind of in a way language works, right? But it's that I've referenced it a few times now tonight, this idea that in the Vajra Sutra, the Buddha says of all types of sentient beings, whatever kind, however they are born, right? So if anybody has ever done any cataloging, archiving, databasing, any kind of taxonomy, right? Right? Any kind of taxonomy archiving. You basically kind of have two choices, right? Letters or numbers, right? A, B, C. Like if you're going to have a list, a taxonomical list of whatever, you got letters and numbers, right? So this idea of classification, classifying things, dividing the world up into sentient and insentient beings and then within the world of sentient beings there's mammals and da 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 and then within the world of the mammals there's da 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 da, -da. and within the world of the felids there's da 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 da, -da. and within the world. so this classification system dividing the world up there is a very subtle interesting relationship there between that idea of classification and seeds uh, bijas and so what we're talking about right now, what we're about to really kind of think about is this idea of, of Tathagata Bijas. It's now, I'm going to re rewind, chapter eight, the family of the Tathagatas, the family of the Buddhas. Um, that title is actually Tathagata Bijas. To seeds of Tathagata. And where we're going is this idea of, again, where, where and how and of what are Buddhas born? What type of seed would I need to plant in order to get a Buddha, right? Where's, where do Buddhas come from? It's, this is a really fascinating idea and question. Again, if we've dispensed with beings as we think and conceive of them then what are we to again sar, sarva rupa sam darshana where's the family where are your friends that's the question that's that's what's at stake All right before i read the answer in the poem let's make sure everybody's on the same page everybody good questions answers i have kind of a big question great um so it seems like ultimately this lesson is one in non-duality we're starting to look at how it functions 
in the world of Bodhisattva? Because everything is everything, so essentially it's non-duality. Gross overgeneralization. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, a big part of this whole suture, what I've sort of, and it's actually what brings us kind of back to this, this um, spectacle here on the board here, this, all mm -hmm. of this. And I've mentioned this a few times, but I think it's always really worth mentioning. It's a, it's about this, this Shari Putra's question of like, Hey, where are we supposed to sit? It's like this empty house. Mm -hmm. Right. And there is a way that a good bodhisattva, good Dharma practitioner understands that the underlying nature of all individuated phenomena mm -hmm. is, is it, that there isn't that individuated phenomena there. Yeah. And it's not, it's not even that, it's not even that the marker is empty because there's yeah. no marker to be empty. And so there's just this, this kind of grand emptiness. Mm -hmm. And there's a way that for a while, Buddhism sort of like si kind of sinks into that emptiness mm. because from a certain like dharmic philosophical point of view, it's true. It's mm -hmm. like, if you really just think about it and kind of think about it, it's like, oh, wow. Uh, so that emptiness thing is going on there, but there's a way again, and, and there's critiques of the Zen Buddhist tradition that they sink too deep into that emptiness. Mm -hmm. And so as I have been, uh, the way that I describe the Malakirti and Mahayana Buddhism, and especially this type of Buddhism that's on the board, I describe it not as about emptiness, but as about fullness. Yes. And what the fullness is, is that yes, like each individuated object, like this marker, the nature yeah. of said marker is empty. And that's the emptiness side of it, or it's the whole freaking universe yes. <laughs> in my hand. I got it. And so it's sort of, yeah, so that you got it. So then that's it. Um, but so what is, what we're, and that's, so again, I kind of mentioned this earlier, that's not, really non-dual it's actually yeah. something a little subtler mm -hmm. than that in a way and it's a, a trip because <laughs> when you start walking yeah. through the world and start seeing uh, the the way i often describe it is is like as a giant monolithic whole rubik's cube <laughs> where mm -hmm. the the thing that is at the forefront of your mind oh look a marker must be a whiteboard in a library and a dude teaching yeah. da, 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 da. And then as soon as you say whiteboard, it's like, well, then that must be a marker. Couldn't possibly be a fountain pen. So this idea of like <laughs> everything kind of being uh, this kind of whole, which mm -hmm. then from the Bodhisattva is important because then all other sentient beings quickly get engulfed in, in you. <laughs> and one's compassion then, you know, is... Potentially now infinite. I get the whole mustard seed in the Mount Maru. Got Yay. it. <laughs> cool. Okay, thanks for explaining that. No problem. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? Everybody good on this profound question of the family? Right? This is like wild, heavy stuff. And again, we're talking about, well, we started by talking about disease, sickness, the Malakirti sick, so we started talking about disease, sickness, and dying, the dying body. So now we, we started by talking about death, and then I referenced, uh, some night I referenced the great T.S. Eliot quote from the four, four Quartets. He says, that which is only living can only die. I hate to interrupt, but I have a note. On Wikipedia, it says in this chapter that he's feigning his illness to teach a lesson. <laughs> Indeed, he is. <laughs> well, we're we're gonna get back to Upaya in a second, but yes, okay, yes. So, um, yeah. So this idea of this uh, family, I want to get back to this idea of Sarvadarshana. Everybody, good on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then. 
Yeah, maybe I think it would be good if nobody has any of the questions, it'd be good if I read Vimalakirti's poem response, then we'll have time to chat about it. So I did the thing again. I'm, the, my notes got so overwhelming, I just typed out a clean version. So I want everybody to know, I again, I'm kind of following the Thurman here, but I've done... Um, uh, I've done a lot of language change to make it ring for your ears, right? So just to start us off, though, again, the Bodhisattva asks, where's everybody at? Where's your kin? Where's your family? Where are your friends, right? Thus addressed, Billy Chavi Vimalakirti spoke the following verses to the Bodhisattva Sarva Rupa Samdarshana. Pranya, transcendent wisdom, is the mother of all true bodhisattvas. Upaya, skillful means, is their father. Guides of the world are born of such parents. Their wife is the joy of the Dharma. Kindness and compassion, metta and karuna, are their daughters. Dedication and truth are their sons. And their home, is deep thought on the meaning of emptiness. The defilements, the dust of this world, are their disciples, controlling them at will. Their friends are the 37 aids to enlightenment, by which they realize supreme enlightenment. Their band ever with them consists of the paramitas. Their chorus is the four means to, to unification. Their music is the teaching of the Dharma. Their Dharani incantations make their garden, which blossoms with the flowers of the seven factors of enlightenment, with trees of great wealth of the Dharma and fruits of the knowledge of liberation. Their pool consists of the eight liberations filled with the water of Samadhi covered with the lotuses of the, of the seven purities, whoever bathes therein becomes immaculate. The bearers of the sedan are the six super knowledges. Their vehicle is the unexcelled Mahayana. The, the driver is the spirit of enlightenment and their path is the eightfold path of peace. Their ornaments are the 32 auspicious signs and the 80 marks. Their garland is virtuous aspiration and their clothing is good conscience and consideration. Their wealth is the holy Dharma and their business is its teaching. Their great income is pure practice and it is dedicated to unsurpassable enlightenment. Their bed consists of the four foundations of mindfulness, and their bedspread is pure livelihood. Their awakening consists of jnana, knowledge, which is constant learning and deep meditation. Their food is the ambrosia of the teachings, and their drink is the juice of liberation. Their morning bath is pure aspiration, morality, their unguents and perfumes. Having conquered all harmful passions, they are invincible heroes. Having subdued the four types of evil maras, they raise their banner on the field of enlightenment. They manifest birth voluntarily, yet they are not born, nor do they originate. They shine in all the fields of the Buddhas, just like the rising sun. Though they worship Buddhas by the millions with every conceivable offering, they never dwell upon the least difference between the Buddhas and themselves. They journey to all Buddha lands in order to bring benefit to all living beings, yet they see all those lands as just like empty space, free of any conceptual constructed notions of living beings. The fearless bodhisattvas can manifest in a single instant the shapes, sounds, and manners of behavior of all living beings. 
Although they recognize the deeds of the four Maras, they can get along even with the four Maras. <laughs> For even such activities as these may be manifested by those perfected in upaya, skillful means. They play with illusory manifestations in order to develop living beings, showing themselves to be old or sick, and even at times manifesting their own deaths. They demonstrate the consumption of the earth in consuming flames at the end of the world in order to demonstrate impermanence to living beings with the notion of permanence. Invited by hundreds of thousands of living beings all in the same country, they partake of offerings in the homes of all and dedicate all for the sake of enlightenment. They excel at all esoteric sciences and in the many different crafts, and they bring forth the happiness of all living beings. By devoting themselves as renunciant monks and nuns, Indras, Brahmas, and Mahishvaras, they may become fire or water or earth or wind. During times of maladies, they become the best of holy medicine. They make beings well and happy and bring about their liberation. During times of famine, they become food and drink, having first alleviated thirst and hunger. Then they teach the Dharma to living beings. During times of swords, they meditate on kindness, introducing nonviolence to hundreds of millions of living beings. In the middle of great battles, they remain impartial to both sides, for bodhisattvas of great strength delight in the reconciliation of conflict. In order to help living beings, they voluntarily descend into the hells which are attached to all the inconceivable Buddha lands. They manifest, they manifest their lives in all the species of the animal kingdom, teaching the Dharma everywhere. Thus, they are called leaders. They display sensual enjoyment to worldlings and trances to the meditative. They completely conquer all the Maras and all and all of them and offer all of them no chance to prevail. Just as it can show that a lotus cannot exist in the center of a fire, so the bodhisattvas show the ultimate unreality of both sensual pleasures and trances. They intentionally become escorts to win over the will of men. And having caught them with the hook of desire, they establish them in Buddha knowledge. <laughs> in order to help living beings, they always become great chieftains, captains, priests, and ministers, even prime ministers. For the sake of the poor, they become inexhaustible treasurers, causing those to whom they give their gifts to conceive the spirit of enlightenment. They become invincible champions for the sake of the proud and vain, and having bestowed fearlessness upon them, they develop them toward enlightenment. They become great holy people with all the super knowledges and pure continence, and thus induce living beings to the practices of patience, gentleness, and discipline. Here in the world, they fearlessly behold those who are masters to be served, and they become their servants or serve as their disciples. Well-trained in upaya, skillful means, they demonstrate all activities, whichever possibly may be the means to make beings delight in the Dharma. Their practices are infinite, and their spheres of influence are infinite. Having perfected an infinite wisdom, they liberate an infinity of sentient beings. Even for the Buddhas themselves, during millions and millions of eons, or even a hundred million eons, it would be hard to express all of their virtues. Except for the most inferior being without any intelligence at all, who, having heard this teaching, would not conceive the spirit for supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. That's the end of the chapter. I believe that's the end of the chapter. I do have a few more comments, but any questions, answers? That was beautiful. Yay, I'm so glad you thought so.
Yeah. I I tried I tried to get it all in. Uh, Madhuri Yana chilling in the pool of the Moksha liberation, right? One of the little guys getting a suntan from the the light of knowledge there, the light of Yana. Um, I did want to comment, of course, on these beautiful lotuses. That last chapter, they got all stuck with the lotuses, but they have been reborn in their on their lotus in their Buddha land. So, you know, insofar as this is kind of a um, a conversionary type of a text, they have been converted. They've seen the light, right? The light of Jnana and there. Um, the Bodhisattvas, of course, are on some jeweled lotus thrones, right? So we're going to save, they, they just, they just little Buddha buds, right? They just little Buddha buds. So they're there. This beautiful, uh, in the, in the poem, right, that the Bodhisattvas band is the Paramitas, right? And their chorus, the four means of unification, which is a beautiful idea that pops up in uh, the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Malakirti Sutra, all of these inconceivable sutras, it's some really um, important wisdom that I, is, uh, um, uh, it's a resource that's not being tapped. And it's this really interesting discourse on community and keeping social cohesion focused on these four means of unification, dana or giving, which of course is like the paramita premier, but also kind speech, volunteerism, and cooperation. These are like virtues of the bodhisattva, but it's um, actually the reason why I wanted to mention this is, is that there's a really weird language that gets used a lot in Mahayana sutras that puts people off. And it's the language of bodhisattvas saving sentient beings. Saving is like, it, 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 it's become like, it's just the default way that people talk about this. But I want you to, I kind of in a way, rather than you not, like then rather than you not doing that idea or not thinking in terms of saving sentient beings, I would rather actually hip you to what they're talking about. So you might want to save some sentient beings. So the language of saving sentient beings is like saving them from themselves, saving them from samsara. And it's like this idea that the bodhisattvas are in the business of creating social cohesion, cooperation, um, kindness, generosity. And that's how they save or develop. That's another language that gets used in other sutras. Bodhisattvas save or develop sentient beings. This is not a messianic, um, you know, a complex kind of idea of like saving people. It's actually, well, if you go back to the first two installments of the Vimalakirti experience, I leaned in a little heavy with this project, the Mahayana project of essentially trying to turn the whole world into a safe place, a, a vihara or a monastery, but I qualified that by making sure everybody knew I didn't mean turn the whole world into a celibate world of, of renunciants. I set it up as that the old school Shravaka way, the old school Buddhist way was about creating a safe haven from the crazy world. And they were going to kind of let the world stay crazy. That was Mara's domain or the four Maras in, in the poem they talk about. But that was Mara's domain. So let's carve out a safe little niche where we can teach people a transcendent method for uh, escaping Mara's grasp. Yeah, let's do it. And so they created this uh, movement and they did that. And it's great that they did that. And it's great that there's viharas and monasteries that we can go to and seek shelter and refuge and take refuge. But the idea is, is that this Buddhism thing kept going and at a certain point, they started being interested in, oh, let's just turn the whole world into a safe place. That Wouldn't that be easier? Let's just do that. And so in order to do that, we're going to have to create social cohesion, unification, and all of that. And that, so that's what the bodhisattvas are in the business of doing. In many ways, this, again, this language of saving sentient beings is, it's a little problematic, but just wanted you to know that. 
Is that why it's important? Okay. Oh, I can't hear you. Tania, I, you went. Sorry, I couldn't hear the your question. So we'll get back up. Oh, you're writing it out. That's cool. So any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? I got just two more comments. Cool. So I'll wait to see if Tania writes. But so two things really quickly. Um, uh, one, well, one, I wanted to make a joke. I wanted to make a joke. So if you got the whole that his house is empty, right? then this gives a whole new meaning to the idea of a home birth. All right, so da 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 right? Yeah, okay, I had to, I had to do it. So that's that. The, the second one, that's that not a joke. This is an interpretive thing that I wanted to also, um, wanted to not lose tonight's opportunity to share with you. It goes back to the last chapter. The goddess showed up, dropped all the flowers on everybody. They stuck to the Shravakas. The Bodhisattvas, they love flowers, right? I'm going to read that in a second. But, and then they love the flowers. They had a problem with the flowers. And I gave you the standard interpretation of that, which was that there's a rule that monks can't wear garlands and flowers in their hair. And so uh, this, it, the sticking, the flowers sticking to them, they were breaking the rules. And so they were so hung up with breaking the rules that they, it was like, they didn't understand that being hung up about breaking the rules was breaking the rules. So that was sort of that, that's the mainline interpretation of the flowers. But I also took it that step further by suggesting that the flowers, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the goddess, that the flowers were sort of this feminine, a feminine vibe, a feminine thing going on. And so the flowers sticking to them was sort of like this male-female problem that's in Theravada. And so they're hung up on the feminine being bad and the male being good in that way. So the flowers were sticking to them. There's one more interpretation that I think is really, really sweet, real sweet. And it's this idea that the flowers, the uh, 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 garland or a lei, like the Hawaiian tradition, that what they represent in that chapter are adornments, adornments, flowers in your hair or a little bit of a little, you know, and the Theravada, the Shravakas, they were not into adornments. And yes, I already mentioned physically adorning. But what I want to suggest as an interpretation is that the, the, these uh, Shravakas, the old school, they also, they didn't want, they wanted their Buddhism without any of this flower business. I don't want any of this, this, uh, what is he, is he relaxing? <laughs> what are you doing, Michael? What are you doing? <laughs> right? So I want you to, to know that that's also what's in, you know, this, um, the, the, the giant uh, flower ornament scripture. This is the giant suture. This is just one volume of it. It's three volumes. This is the mother of the inconceivable liberation of which the Vimalakirti is just a drop in the bucket, right? Well, it's, This is the flower, and 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 th these guys are like, no, that I don't get it. I don't get these flower worlds bl blooming into flower worlds, blooming into flower world, lotuses growing out of the mud. Like, what are you talking about? I want to sit. I want to meditate. I want. I want. My, you know, it's like that's the idea of the shravakas, and so this is all window dressing. It's called upaya. <laughs> That's the idea. And so again, the flower chapter was about, I want my Dharma without any flowers, thank you. And this is saying, no, this is like, this is beautiful. And so again, if you're into the fullness, if you're into the more artistic, creative type of Buddhism, 
they're interested in adornments and flowers, but in a really profound way where, you know, I, I actually, I haven't done this, this uh, Vimalakirti, but I often compare Mahayana Buddhism to, to rap, to like hip hop music. There are so many analogies and it's, and the, the poetics, the literally the fact that all of these are in poetic verse is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of ciphers that the way a lot of rap and hip hop works is that, you know, what they say, they, what they say they're talking about is not what they're necessarily talking about. Right. Um, you know, sometimes obviously with rap, it can get a little dangerous, right. When they're going to talk about murdering you on the microphone. But the idea here is that there's an extra extrapolatory, if that's a word, extrapolatory kind of thing that happens in hip hop where when you know what the words sort of are indicating, then I can take it up a notch and start weaving together a coat of all of these similes and all of these metaphors and I'll put on the coat, right? So there's a lot of that. And so again, if, if, if you don't like <laughs> that type of poetry, then maybe this type of Buddhism isn't for you, but I want everybody to know that that's what this type of Buddhism is this really beautiful, ornate, full, creative, poetic, kind of um, wild psychedelic type of Buddhism. So, all right, I think that, that those were my notes, those are my ideas. Yeah? All Sorry. right. Did you read my questions? Oh, I didn't, I didn't. So I'm terrible. Oh, and Brandon's got his hand raised. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Oh my God. Hold on. I'm just like trying to get my body Safa on. That's what it's all about. You know, and you know, I'll just on that note too, I will say this idea that, you know, this is a wild sutra. You know, like I said, go back and read chapter two. You'll be surprised at what's in there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's about exposure to these ideas. It's about putting your mind in these places and it's a practice over time. So, yo, you, the, uh, Tania, the spirit, conceiving the spirit of inconceivable enlightenment or of uh, Anatara Samyak Sambodhi, that's it. Yeah. That's it. The, 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 not the wanting of course, but that um, aspiration. So. Mm -hmm. um, well. Are we done for the night? I think we are. Brendan, did you want to, you got to rock it. I, I, well, I don't want to like uh, go too far back, but um, I, I, the, the part where they, where he's like, and no beings, even the gods are real. And then he sort of goes into like all of the fantastical stuff that, that uh, the bodhisattva, bodhisattvas can do. I, I don't know how to think about that. I mean, I kind of like it. I like that they're willing to like, say sort of crazy stuff like that um but i was just wondering what you thought about how he kind of rounds out that stanza mm. oh i i can't comment i'm i'm lost i'm i'm already okay ne oh. never mind is this the ultimate like you they take uh emptiness and go buck wild with it like yeah it's about this idea that you don't you can't get to the fullness but but through the emptiness yeah like it, you got to empty it out and then you can get this back you come back to the fullness in that way right it's like donovan said first there was a mountain then there's not a mountain then there's a mountain and it's that idea that it, you've got the mountain then you need to empty the mountain out then you get the mountain back but in, now it's in a mustard seed right so that idea. So Brendan, for sure, that idea of like, uh, yeah. you got to go through the emptiness to get the fullness. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's, thank you. That's super helpful. Thanks for tonight. Michael. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, man. So happy. Thank you all so much. Katie, take it away. <laughs> thank you. That was amazing. Thank yeah. all of you for the awesome questions and comments. There is just no better way to spend a Sunday night than doing this. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. Um, if anyone is interested in these four virtues of giving Donna, kind speech, volunteerism, and cooperation, 
Uh, you can enact one of them right now uh, and give some dana to the collective. Um, and in fact, the collective is all volunteers who are uh, cooperating to create this thing. And one of our highest values is kind speech. So if you're interested in volunteering at the collective, um, we need help doing the sort of day-to-day -day things that are involved with running a now digital meditation center. Um, and if you're interested in helping out, get in touch with us and we have open roles now for volunteers. So I'm gonna put our email address here um, and you can email us. Let us know if you're interested in volunteering and we will find you a role that's a good match. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, I know I personally could probably stay here for an hour just asking uh, MC Owen some questions. And um, fortunately for all of us, he's taking students now. So he has a SoundCloud and the SoundCloud is Lotus Underground. And if you go to Lotus Underground, you can find his information um, and you can sign on um for like some one-on-one -on -one tutoring sutra study q a just going deeper with the vimalakirti sutra any and all dharmas i think are covered or or just lotusunderground.com the brand new lotusunderground.com so I'm, 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 I'm out there folks <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you michael thank you everybody and see you all back here on thursday thanks everybody Thank you. Michael, good night. Good night. Thank you, Mike. Have a great day.